the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, thank you. Let the record reflect that all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Um, so why don't we just go right down the line, start with you, Dr. Dayhut, and just come right down the line. Mm -hmm. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, for Mr. Chairman, for giving me the opportunity to speak. And I also wish to thank you for the accommodating my schedule and allowing me to leave early today. My name is Dr. Bill Dayhut and I'm the clinical director of the National Cancer Institute. My particular research focuses on the development of novel therapeutic strategies for the treatment of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the second highest cause of cancer deaths for men in the United States. The good news is the overall death rates from prostate cancer are on the decline. Most think that this improvement is due to a combination of improved treatments and possibly earlier detection. However, it is important to remember that there is not just one prostate cancer. Some patients respond to treatment and live out normal lifespans, while other lives are cut short by aggressive disease. The clinical course of the disease reflects the interplay between the biology of the tumor, the genetics of the patient, factors in the environment, and available treatments. There's a huge challenge in the field right now. We are struggling to differentiate lethal or deadly prostate cancer from non-lethal prostate cancer a form of the disease unlikely to ever cause symptoms or lead to death. Another unfortunate reality is that the burden of prostate cancer is disproportionately borne by African American men who have a 60% higher incidence of prostate cancer as compared to white men and are twice as likely to die from the disease. Many men will die with prostate cancer but not from prostate cancer and will never have any cancer related symptoms. Since all treatments have side effects, with some being quite significant, the potential for overtreatment is a real problem in this disease. Nevertheless, nearly 28,000 men die yearly from this disease, while many others have cancer-related pain. Thus, the single biggest challenge for researchers is to identify a means to distinguish lethal from non-lethal prostate cancer. Without this information, me, we are likely to undertreat or overtreat our patients. Even within these broad categories, prostate tumors may have very different characteristics, which may ultimately guide treatment decisions. Not all prostate tumors are like other prostate tumors, and they do not respond to therapy in the same ways. In fact, the biology of a given prostate tumor may turn out to be much more like a breast tumor than it's like another prostate tumor. NCI is moving aggressively towards the goal of distinguishing lethal from non-lethal prostate cancers by researching biomarkers, genetics and molecular characterization, nanotechnology, and imaging techniques that may help to differentiate the aggressive prostate cancers from the less threatening ones. While the use of prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, has led to the earlier detection of prostate cancer, some patients with elevated PSA values are found not to have prostate cancer when biopsied. Furthermore, there is no safe PSA value, and even patients with very low PSA values have a surprisingly high risk of prostate cancer. We are actively searching for other biomarkers, substances that may be found in tumor tissue or released from a tumor into the blood or other body fluids such as the urine that will distinguish between cancerous and benign conditions and between slow-growing cancers and fast-growing, potentially lethal cancers. The identification of such biomarkers is a high priority in order to provide safe and effective large population screening. The NCI clinical cancer team is studying new therapeutic approaches to prostate cancer through various clinical trials. For example, an NCI-developed prostate cancer vaccine has shown significant benefit in a phase two study at the NIH and should be moving into larger clinical trials soon. NCI has also participated in the research and development of a drug known as Bevacizumab, which is a drug developed to target blood vessel growth. The results of a very large clinical trial using this agent in men with advanced prostate cancer will likely be available in two to three months. We are continuing to press forward in our efforts to develop the knowledge that will allow us to treat prostate cancer based on specific molecular characteristics of the tumors that tell us about the way the genes and proteins interact. In order for this to be successful, we need to understand the relevant target in the tumor and develop potent drugs effective against this target. Although this targeted approach has been successful for infectious disease world for nearly a century, unfortunately, therapy for metastatic prostate cancer has already remained trial and error. That is, the drugs are not targeted or personalized for an individual-specific type of prostate cancer. 
we are aggressively pursuing research to enable us to personalize cancer therapies. We are optimistic that through the specific genetic abnormalities in an individual patient's prostate tumor, that we will be able not only to identify the aggressive forms of the disease, but also develop specific treatments appropriate for the patient's cancer, ultimately reducing death and suffering from prostate cancer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Dr. DeHood. Dr. Brawley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members. I'm Otis Brawley, a practicing oncologist. I am the chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society, and I'm also a professor of hematology, oncology, medicine, and epidemiology at Emory University. On behalf of the American Cancer Society and the millions of cancer patients and survivors, thank you for holding this hearing and for your continued leadership in the fight against cancer. As you know, the Society yesterday released updated guidelines on prostate cancer screening. We customarily undertake such reviews when new evidence or other information emerges. In the case of prostate cancer screening, results from two randomized trials of screening were reported in early 2009. The finding of these studies, combined with other advances in knowledge related to prostate cancer screening, prompted this review. The review recommended no major changes in our position with respect to prostate cancer screening. The Society continues to recommend asymptomatic men who have at least a 10-year life expectancy should discuss with their doctor the uncertainties, the possible benefits, and the known risks of screening for prostate cancer before deciding whether to be tested. There are uncertainties, there are known proven risks, and there are, at this time, possible benefits. We also provide additional guidance about testing for African-American men and those at high risk. The bottom line is men need to have the substantive discussion with their doctors in order to make meaningful decisions about which preventive services and early detection choice uh, tests are the best choice for them. Other organizations in the U.S., Canada, Europe, and Australia that issue prostate cancer screening guidelines have also issued statements calling for this informed, shared decision-making, realizing that prostate cancer screening is not yet proven to save lives. I want to make sure my testimony is very clear about the Society's position on prostate cancer screening, as it has sometimes been misunderstood or mischaracterized. The Society is not against testing for early prostate cancer detection if a man has been given the true facts about what we know and what we don't know about the uncertainties of prostate cancer screening, what we do know about the proven harms and the benefits and the possible benefits of screening. The Society, along with many other health and medical organizations as well, are against screening when the doctor-patient conversation describes the benefit, uh, to describe the benefits and harms does not take place in a meaningful way. We are only against prostate cancer screening when there is no informed decision making. As an oncologist, I've counseled and treated hundreds of prostate cancer patients in my career. I've observed firsthand the traumatic impact this disease has on men and their families. I firmly understand the emotion involved when someone says their life has been saved by a PSA test. But in every instance, we need to better explain the limitations of the test and make sure we don't overstate the benefits. There is legitimate argument based on the scientific evidence as to whether prostate cancer screening saves lives. Clear evidence has emerged from several trials indicating that prostate cancer screening leads to unnecessary treatment. For example, many men who do not have prostate cancer will screen positive and require an unnecessary biopsy for diagnosis. In addition, even if this biopsy finds cancer, many prostate cancers grow so slowly that they may not actually pose a threat to the patient's life or his continued quality of life. This is an important point because treatment of prostate cancer is associated with symptoms and side effects that can interfere significantly with quality of life, such as impotence and incontinence. The key problem is that we don't have, and we've yet to discover, definitive uh, tests that tell us the cancers that kill and require treatment versus the cancers that don't kill and need to be watched. One can reasonably ask 
How did we get into this quandary of not knowing whether prostate cancer screening saves lives? Truth is, the promotion of the PSA test has delayed our medical progress because we have come to rely on what is really an imperfect test instead of doing the clinical trials to evaluate PSA and actually defining the scientific questions and actually going out to answer those scientific questions. The plain fact is the PSA test is not good enough. We need to invest in something, in developing something that's better. We also need to invest in a way to determine the deadly tumors versus the tumors which are not threatening life. In closing, increased funding for NIH and the National Cancer Institute would do much to enhance current discovery efforts and also enable us to design better tests and better treatments for prostate cancer. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Brawley. Dr. Bess. Chairman Towns and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to con convey the important efforts being supported by Congress through the Department of Defense Prostate Cancer Research Program, also known as the PCRP. My name is Dr. Carolyn Best, and I am currently Program Manager for the PCRP, which has received over $1 billion in funding since the beginning of the program in fiscal year 1997. Here with me today is Captain Melissa Kame, my supervisor and the director of the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, under which the PCRP is one of the largest of 19 programs. The PCRP is the second largest nationwide funder of prostate cancer research after the NIH. The program's vision is nothing less than to conquer prostate cancer, which translates into our mission to fund research that will eliminate all death and suffering from this disease. We fund highly innovative science to stimulate major advancements in research and clinical care. All PCRP funds are openly competed. We contract with hundreds of leading prostate cancer scientists, clinicians, and survivors to select research proposals that are both of the highest scientific merit and that best fit the objectives of the program. With the $1 billion in funding this program has received during its existence, it has provided nearly 2,200 grants to support prostate cancer research in almost every state and the District of Columbia. Our grantees are studying better approaches for prostate cancer prevention, screening, imaging, diagnosis, treatments, and treatment decision making, identifying aggressive disease, and discovering the underlying environmental and genetic factors that contribute to prostate cancer. Our grantees are also striving to answer the most critical questions in prostate cancer research and clinical care, which several of the witnesses have brought up today. Does prostate cancer screening lead to more harm than good? And if true, how can this be corrected? Which men with prostate cancer need to be treated and which do not? How can we develop more effective treatments for preventing or curing the advanced forms of the disease, disease that are responsible for prostate cancer death? So to briefly highlight just two of our grants, since fiscal year 2005, the PCRP, together with the Prostate Cancer Foundation, has supported the Prostate Cancer Clinical Trials Consortium, which has brought together 13 major cancer centers across the nation to conduct faster, more precise, and more cost-effective clinical testing of new treatments. In under four years, the consortium has conducted more than 60 early phase studies investigating over 30 different drugs and has moved five potential therapies into the final phase, phases of testing before the new drugs can be approved. Another key research effort is the Prostate Cancer Project, or PCAP. PCAP is a major collaboration among institutions in Louisiana, North Carolina, and New York that seeks to identify the factors that contribute to the highly disproportionate impact of prostate cancer on African American men, as others have noted, who are more than twice as likely to suffer and die from prostate cancer than Caucasian men. Over 2,000 men have participated in this landmark study, which may finally help us understand and address the factors that cause health disparity. The effectiveness of the PCRP relies on a, sp a strong partnership between the U.S. government and prostate cancer survivors, scientists, and clinicians. These groups work closely together to determine the program priorities, adapting them every year to ensure that we are continually addressing the most important needs. For example, for fiscal year 2010, the program is fo focused on two major challenges. 
First, to develop effective treatments for advanced prostate cancer so that fewer men will be lost from their families and society to, to, due to this disease. And secondly, to distinguish lethal from non-lethal disease so that a great deal fewer men diagnosed with prostate cancer will undergo treatment that is actually unnecessary, yet causes them intense personal suffering and has an immense financial impact on our health care system. To conclude, the PCRP provides direct and undiluted support for prostate cancer research, funding innovative, gap-filling projects and researchers that might not otherwise be supported in the battle against this disease. So I thank you once again for your interest in hearing about this program, and Captain Kamen, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bess. Uh, Dr. Kaminsky? Chairman Ta Towns, thank you very much for the opportunity to address you. Um, the Uniformed Services University is your university, and we're, I'm here to talk about one of the programs that Congress actually set up at the university, the uh, Center for Prostate Disease Research, and it was the insight of Congress that actually um, put this, this program on the map uh, at, uh, within the military. And I think that the thing that's most important about what it, what it put on the map is the fact that within the military health care system, we have equal access to health care. And with this, this particular center, which is set up in three, diff three different aspects, a clinical research center, a basic science research center, and a database and tissue repository, um, the center has actually made uh, enormous inroads into understanding uh, the disease in an equal access uh, medical care system. Um, the, the center was the first to actually demonstrate that African-American males in this system actually uh, needed to be screened earlier and uh, more often uh, uh, with, the, with the testing that's available today. The, the, the challenge for the center is everything that Dr. Brawley talked about, and that is how do we really come up with better screening tools, and that's really what the, what the center is all about. Uh, from the standpoint of trying to really look at the aggressive forms of the disease and how to actually get there quicker, faster, better. Um, today we're working on new genetic tools to try to do that and actually have some, some products that are hopefully going to uh, make transitions. Um, but one of the, the, the key, key pieces of this center is actually its database, uh, which is following over 28,000 uh, uh, patients in a longitudinal study with over uh, 102,000 uh, tissue and blood samples so that we can actually look at and analyze the disease across time. So um, to keep us flowing. I, I'm going to hold my comments there and hopefully uh, questions at the end about this particular center and about essentially Congress's wisdom in setting up a center like this at the university within the military health, uh, military treatment uh, facilities uh, really is, allows us to do things that maybe some others can't because of the kind of health care system that the military has. And again, thanks for the opportunity to talk. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, Dr. Stern, is that correct, Stern? Uh, Chairman Towns, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your continuous support of the Admitech Foundation work. There are many members of this committee who are supporting our work. As you know, there is no family, no community in this country that is not impacted by prostate cancer. When my father's prostate cancer was missed at a leading national hospital, a very powerful point was brought home. In spite of the magnitude of prostate cancer epidemic, men do not have accurate diagnostics for early detection, which is critical to cure cancer and to save lives. Indeed, as reflected in the new guidelines, by American Cancer Society, there is no confidence in the current diagnostic tools for screening and early detection. An American man dies every 19 minutes because is, even though prostate cancer can be cured when diagnosed early. Mr. Dana Jennings, an editor for the New York Times, echoed sentiments of millions of people when he said, Prostate cancer and its treatment breed anger and confusion among the men who have it and those 
who loved, who loved them. Mr. Jennings, age 49, was diagnosed with advanced and aggressive prostate cancer only recently. He underwent surgery followed by radiation and hormonal treatment with the latter being essentially, in plain speak, medical castration. According to a recent VA study, men aged 50 and younger have had seven-fold increase in the incidence of prostate cancer since 1986 when PSA was invented. These stories, my father's story, Mr. Jennings' stories, reflect our prostate cancer crisis. Many other speakers pointed out the first aspect of the prostate cancer crisis, the sheer magnitude of the epidemic. Two million American men live with prostate cancer and many more millions face a threat of prostate cancer each year. African American men, as was pointed out repeatedly, are disproportionately affected, unfortunately, for all these millions of men. There, are no, there is another aspect of prostate cancer crisis. Current diagnostic tools are unreliable, and as it has been pointed out, cause a staggering extent of unnecessary biopsy, unnecessary treatment, and failed patient care, which in turn reduce quality of life in millions of men and at billions of dollars in healthcare costs. I have shared with the committee in, <clears throat> in my written testimony my estimate that there is over five billion each year wasted in healthcare costs. Admitech Foundation mission is to end our prostate cancer crisis by developing accurate imaging tools for early detection and minimally invasive treatment. I'd like to issue a disclaimer Imaging will not play significant role in mass screening and prevention, but imaging will be critical for early detection and minimally invasive treatment. And here is why. Slide number one, please. On the left of the slide, you can see film-based film digital mammography in 1991, when I was the head of diagnostic imaging at the National Cancer Institute. At that time, with small field of view digital mammography, we were lucky to see a larger breast cancer. On the right, you can see digital mammography, full field, uh, done today. There is a striking difference in the quality. It renders entire breast, can uh, breast cancer tissue transparent, and we can see a tiny breast cancer. Precise imaging has made it possible to guide needle biopsies, to detect breast cancer very early, and to save lives. And just as importantly, to replace a radical and deforming surgery with image-guided minimally invasive lumpectomies. While prostate cancer is even more common than breast cancer, national investment lags far behind, and men do not have accurate imaging akin to life-saving mammograms. With congressional support and federal investment, we, co we, we can create similar opportunities for men. We are excited to report new promising research. Slide number two, please. On the left, you, you see data from Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. It shows advanced prostate cancer missed with every imaginable current diagnostic, including blind biopsy. There are reports from all over the world that show that MRI-guided biopsy can detect at least 59-60% of prostate cancer that was missed by blind biopsies at least twice. There are growing reports, I am happy to report, that imaging technologies, molecular imaging MRI, can determine what's aggressive and what needs to be treated, and what's not aggressive, non-lethal, that cannot be treated. This report creates great hope for the future of prostate cancer care, and yet the extremely preliminary further extensive research is needed. On the right-hand side, you see three-dimensional MRI that shows, slight, that shows small and early prostate cancer rendered in red. When we have this kind of three-dimensional data, we can administer it image-guided, minimally invasive treatment to eradicate cancer 
while sparing normal tissues to avoid complications. These procedures can be performed in outpatient clinic with minimal costs, complications, and discomfort to patients. And that is how we will end prostate cancer crisis with advanced imaging. What we need to succeed is a Manhattan Project from prostate, for prostate cancer diagnostics, if you will, in order to save lives, improve quality of life in millions of men, and save billions of dollars. I just was told that, that Representative Cummings, a member of this committee, just introduced HR Prime Act, HR 40, 4756, that calls for national investment of $500 million over five years in medical imaging. It is only 10% of the annual waste in healthcare costs. This act also calls, calls for increased $100 million for um, improved in vitro diagnostics over five years. It is only 2% uh, of annual waste. This success of the Prime Act, at the end of the five years, we will have accurate imaging technologies for improved early detection and treatment and re reliable in vitro testing for improved mass screening and prevention. I hope that this committee will empower and support NIH and DOD in making research in prostate cancer diagnostics, including imaging, a much higher priority than it has been. Passage of the Prime Act, introduced by Congressman Cummings and Senator Boxer earlier in 2009, will be an important step in that direction. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you so much for your testimony, uh, Dr. Moeller. My name is Jim Moeller, and I'm the chair of the Department of Urology at Roswell Park Cancer Institute in Buffalo, New York. Roswell Park discovered PSA that's been taking a beating here today. Also, I chair the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, commonly called NCCN, Prostate Cancer Treatment Panel. The NCCN consists of 21 of the 40 NCI-designated comprehensive cancer centers. Uh, finally, uh, I'm the principal investigator for PCAP, the North Carolina, Louisiana Prostate Cancer Project that Dr. Best mentioned earlier, which is the largest population-based study of prostate cancer ever undertaken, and half of our patients in that study are African Americans. I'd like to discuss just four points that warrant our attention and then make uh, three recommendations. Uh, the first point is that prior to the development of PSA, only 4% of men diagnosed with prostate cancer could be cured. Most men were diagnosed with prostate cancer, like Congressman Gallo, uh, when it had spread to their bones and caused pain. The standard treatment was androgen deprivation therapy, and mean survival was three years. Now, less than 10% of men are diagnosed with incurable prostate cancer, and five-year survival after treatment is essentially 100%. However, the age-adjusted incidence of prostate cancer has increased 30% since 1994 to produce this 36% reduction in deaths. Now, if we had achieved a 36% reduction in mortality in any other solid cancer in America, there would be cause for jubilation. So why is there so much controversy about PSA? Well, that controversy stems from my second point, and that's a term that hasn't been discussed here yet, autopsy prostate cancer, also called non-lethal prostate cancer earlier. The problem is that the incidence of prostate cancer, if one autopsy the prostate, is approximately the age of the man. In other words, 20% of 20-year-olds already have prostate cancer in their prostate, and 80% of 80-year-olds already have prostate cancer. So prostate biopsies will find about half of these autopsy cancers. Because PSA has been mentioned here today, can be elevated for many reasons, Many men may undergo prostate biopsy and have an autopsy-type prostate cancer found. 
This cancer poses no threat to their life expectancy. The New England Journal of Medicine published back-to-back -back papers in their March 26, 2009 issue that has reignited this controversy about early detection of prostate cancer, which has been uh, increased by the uh, ACS uh, guideline change issued yesterday. The American study uh, shows no apparent benefit from PSA early detection, although many men were ineligible for the study because they probably had already had their potentially fatal prostate cancers diagnosed and treated, and the majority of the men in the arm of the study that was not subjected to screening annually received PSAs anyway from their personal physicians. Finally, the follow-up of this study is so short that any benefit from PSA early detection would not yet be apparent. The European study shows a benefit to early detection using PSA, which is actually surprising to me because its follow-up also is short, and the PSA screening frequency was only once every four years. The press has focused upon the fact that 1,400 men needed to be screened and 49 men needed to be treated in order to prevent one death from prostate cancer in the European study. Overtreatment of prostate cancer would not be an issue if the treatment had no side effects and was free. And this brings me to point three, overtreatment of prostate cancer. The NCCN guidelines have already responded by changing their guidelines last month to focus on more careful detection of aggressive prostate cancer in younger men while urging a more conservative approach to early detection of prostate cancer in older men. The NCCN uh, 2010 guidelines also recommend active surveillance of men who have been found to have low-risk prostate cancer when life expectancy is less than 10 years. In addition, the NCCN has created a new prostate cancer risk category, very low-risk prostate cancer. Active surveillance is the only recommended treatment in this group of men when life expectancy is less than 20 years. So let me emphasize that here is a cancer treatment guideline panel recommending active surveillance instead of treatment. These changes allow appropriate aggressive treatment of men who are at high risk of death from prostate cancer while avoiding overtreatment of men at low risk of prostate cancer death. My last point is how PSA and treatment can actually perform better than it does today. African American men and men with a family history of prostate cancer, especially in their brother or father, represent a group of men that we all are agree are at higher risk of death from prostate cancer. PSA and treatment will perform better if efforts at early detection of prostate cancer are focused on these higher risk groups. So this leads me to my three recommendations. The first hasn't been made by anyone yet. We need a blood or urine test that can be combined with PSA to indicate who doesn't need a biopsy. This is critically important because then men with autopsy type prostate cancer can be spared biopsy and the anxiety attached to the diagnosis of an autopsy prostate cancer. I agree with the other panelists that once diagnosed with prostate cancer and tissue is available, we need better imaging or a tissue-based biomarker of life-threatening prostate cancer. Currently, PSA, extent of disease, and the Gleason grade of cancer correlate with prostate cancer aggressiveness in groups of men, but not in individual patients. More funds must be spent to develop biomarkers of aggressive prostate cancer, and I believe that these markers may come through more careful study of the prostate cancers found in African Americans. Until we succeed in these two areas, the NCCN guidelines should be used to guide the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer to assure that we continue to reduce the mortality from prostate cancer while not subjecting men to the consequences of overtreatment. I thank the committee for their wisdom in addressing these very complex issues posed by prostate cancer. Thank you very much, and let me thank all of you for your testimony. Um, and uh, the way I generally start out, um, I generally ask the witnesses, are there any statements that you've heard that you would like to sort of clarify, give your input to them, be it from the first panel or from this panel? And, um, and the reason I do that is because um, I was at the airport one day and, and the person said to me, I did not agree with anything that that person said. 
and you didn't allow me to respond. So I don't want to be guilty of not allowing you to respond. So that's the first question. Write down. Yes, Dr. Brawley. Yeah, if I may, sir. Uh, in the first panel, I heard that the uh, mortality has gone down, so it must be because of screening. I think it's important to realize that if you go to various countries in Europe, which have, as a policy, decided not to adopt screening because it hasn't been proven to save lives. Mortality has been going down in those countries as well. So it's hard for me to attribute all of the decline in mortality in the United States to screening when there are several other countries, Britain, France, so forth, that have a decline in mortality without having screening. Uh, secondly, uh, Dr. Mueller talked about, my good friend Dr. Mueller, by the way, we've worked together on a number of things, talked about five-year survival. If you're if, when I'm teaching epidemiology and teaching screening, we don't use five-year survival as a good use of outcome. It's not an evaluation of outcome, especially in prostate cancer, where many of the people you pick up with screening uh, would have never died. They had those autopsy-style prostate cancers. They actually artificially push your five-year survival rate up. Uh, and this is best seen, by the way, in the old studies of lung cancer lung cancer screening with chest x-ray. Uh, we've done, by the way, we've been here before. Lung cancer screening was advocated in the United States from 1960 to about 1975. The uh, Otis Brawleys of the 1960s said, let's do a study. Many people said, no, it finds disease earlier. It increases five-year survival rates. When those studies were done, my favorite is the Mayo Clinic study. The death rate on the screened arm of the Mayo Clinic randomized chest x-ray study was 3.2 per thousand per year on the screened arm and 2.8 per thousand per year on the unscreened arm. Keep in mind, survival was increased on the screened arm, but risk of death was increased as well. So when we teach in epidemiology and we're doing screening, we don't look at five-year survival rates. We look at decrease in mortality rates. That's what we want to find. All right. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Moeller. I cannot let uh, misstatements by Otis go uh, unaddressed. Are you guys really friends? <laughs> yes. So okay. um, I always like to say that uh, two people can be looking at a horse, and if one's standing at the head and the other standing at the tail, they describe something that looks very different. And this is many aspects of this debate are about where are you standing. Now, the decrease in mortality in, in uh, Great Britain, which has been argued for to counteract the 36% decline in age-adjusted prostate cancer mortality in America has been thoroughly investigated. Great Britain changed the way that their national registry recorded deaths at autopsy. And when this was accounted for, uh, the decline in prostate cancer mortality in Great Britain basically went away. Uh, I think our country is unique in having had uh, objective evidence of a decline in prostate cancer mortality. This occurs at the same time that the worldwide incidence of prostate cancer is increasing 1.1 percent per year. The reasons for this are unknown. The best evidence suggests that this may be from westernization of the, of the diets. Um, but we, we do not know much more than we do know about prostate cancer. And so uh, Otis very appropriately is challenging the five-year 100% survival uh, being inadequate to say that treatment is effective. We know that as we follow those men longer, many of them are going to recur. But this is the data that is uh, reported by the American Cancer Society and why I confirm, conform to the five-year number. Um, yes, Dr. Stern. Thank you. Um, there was a, a statement made at the previous panel that um, only 25% of women undergoing biopsy have uh, breast cancer. What I would like to refocus, if we look at the number of breast cancer and prostate cancer is close. Let's say it's around 2,000 per year. The average yield, the uh, percentage of men who have 
cancer and undergoing a bi a biopsy according to the la largest trial NCI supported that we have is 12%. So if we look at that and we know from actual numbers that one million men, one million women undergo biopsy every year. However, two million or close to two, two million men undergo biopsy every year. It means that if we had imaging tool that will eliminate, that will be comparable to mammography and will, will eliminate one million biopsies right there and then, there is a possibility to save over two billion dollars. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me now um, go to you, uh, Dr. Brawley. Now I understand, of course, that you are perhaps an you know, you're an expert on cancer screening, and I respect that and really appreciate you, and that you're here and that you, and your work over the years. But before I get to that focus, I want to ask your opinion on an, any correlation between education and mother's diet and why African Americans are significantly more disproportionately impacted by the lethal form of prostate cancer. I lost a brother to it. Uh, yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. We've been working long and hard for probably now 30 years to try to f finally start addressing the question, why do blacks have a higher rate around 1980. And by the way, it's blacks in the Western Hemisphere for sure. Blacks in Brazil and Jamaica have a higher rate, as do blacks in Canada. Uh, don't know about blacks in Africa because there's no good registry there. And the National Cancer Institute of the United States actually tried to establish a registry to try to figure it out and just couldn't. Uh, what data that we do have indicates that a large number of the black prostate cancer problem can be due to diet, it can be due to uh, uh, differences in diet over time, differences in body mass index. There are some studies that have been done primarily in animals that indicate that animals that are fed a high fat diet when they are pregnant, their children will have a differing sensitivity in terms of estrogen and androgen receptors. Uh, when the children are born. So it, there are some sp people who have speculated that it is the socioeconomic status of the fetus and of the mother and the diet of the mother when in utero that actually affects risk of both prostate and breast cancer 40, 50, 60 years after, di uh, after birth. Uh, for example, many people talk about the breast cancer problem in black women with triple negatives. If you go to Scotland, one of the best studies on breast cancer in black women has been done in Scotland where they have no black women. They figured out that women in Scotland who have a lifelong history of poverty, and you can't look at socioeconomic status at the time of diagnosis, you got to look at socioeconomic status over the entire lifetime beginning in utero. W uh, women who are born and have a lifetime of poverty have breast cancers that are more likely to be triple negative, more likely to present at an earlier age, just as black women in the United States. So socioeconomic status, diet, and a number of other f environmental factors actually can change the genetics of a breast cancer. Estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, that's a genetic difference. But white women in Scotland who are poor tend to have more of it than white women in Scotland who are not poor. Dr. Muller. So the North Carolina, Louisiana prostate cancer study is seeking to look at many of these dietary and lifestyle differences may, that may be contributing. Uh, I think it's very important to recognize that there is fundamental differences between the African American prostate and the Caucasian American prostate. And Dr. Browley is exactly correct that we don't know where these come from. But the uh, one of the fundamental questions that PCAP will address is whether the African-American prostate seems to have a revved up androgen axis. The uh, circulating androgens are the same between the two races, but the African-American prostate for unknown reasons has more of the protein that testosterone binds to to turn on growth than does the Caucasian-American prostate. Uh, that 
level of protein is 21% higher in the benign prostate, and then once African American men develop prostate cancer, their cancers have 81% more of this protein. It's completely unclear why that is and whether this is a consequence of diet and lifestyle, has something to do with genet genetic uh, environmental interaction, uh, but uh, much of PCAP is devoted to figuring out whether this is actually true in a large number of men from a population-based uh, series. I still think that most of the di racial differences in prostate cancer mortality stem from socioeconomic uh, disadvantage and not race per se. In fact, when we look at our treatment results in North Carolina and Louisiana, once you correct for socioeconomic status, race is no longer a factor in treatment received or outcome of that treatment. So you're also saying education plays a part? I think that is the greatest uh, contributor to the racial disparity right now. Yes. Sir, sir we have uh, Dr. Moeller and I completely agree on that. And by the way, some of the best early studies to look at black-white differences on this very issue actually came from the intramural Department of Defense prostate cancer program that Dr. Kaminsky represents. All right. Thank you, Mr. And I yield to the uh, ranking member. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, it's not good to find out that to be poor in America can, can kill you. Uh, but it sounds like, once again, that would be the, the short way of expressing what you've found. Uh, you know, we're having a lively debate on health care, and I think it's, uh, it's pretty safe to say on either side of the dais here that we're concerned that there are two Americas relative to health care. Uh, but, I'm, I'm, Dr. Barali, I'm particularly interested in a couple of the things that, that you've attacked because you could tell by the earlier panel, you know, I tend to want to figure out how to fix the Hubble telescope in the sense that we've put a lot of money into this project and it, and it doesn't appear if 30 out of 31 people that get treated would be just as well off not being treated, uh, that, we, that we've yet focused on the right answer, which means we don't have the, the real uh, visibility we need. Uh, the, uh, earlier in, in, actually it was in, uh, uh, Dr. DeHunt's, but he's left a statement, but, it, but I think you're probably very capable of answering this. When we talk about prostate cancer, are we really talking about flu, I'm using the term broadly, flu of the prostate versus H1N1 of the prostate and some other group of various things? We're using a broad brush statement when in fact it's cancer in the prostate, not prostate cancer. What we're talking about is actually prostate cells that become malignant and start growing. But they're malignant due to different forms of cancer in the sense that they react differently, they're differently treated, that if you could isolate, if you will, various strains and treat them appropriately, you could have better results. Yeah, th that I would agree with, but the cancer itself originates from cells in the prostate, and there are a variety of different, more aggressive, less aggressive. One of our problems actually is that uh, Virchow in 1848 described what prostate cancer was, and he described it using autopsy specimens. And now, even though we've moved into a molecular age 160 years later, we're still using his light microscope definition of cancer, and that's why we really desperately need molecular tests are actually where I think it will come from where we can say Mr. Smith you have prostate cancer but it needs to be watched Mr. Jones you have prostate cancer and we need to treat it aggressively because if we don't treat it aggressively it's going to bother you okay. now uh, the American Cancer Society has put out figures on both breast cancer and prostate cancer and they're they're relatively interesting in the sense of their similarity. Breast cancer, 192,370 cases uh, of invasive breast cancer, 192,280 new cases of prostate cancer. I noticed a, a word missing there. The, uh, the death uh, today, after all the good work that we earlier talked about breast cancer, cancer from breast cancer, 50, 000, or, sorry, 40,170. From prostate cancer, 27,000. To understand the statistics and balance it here for us lay people, if I understand correctly, the 192,000 
prostate cases, if you took out the ones that were likely not to kill you, that's hindsight, but if you took those out, you're probably not talking about 192,000. You're not even talking about 19,000. You're talking about probably 10,000 cases, uh, new cases. And then you, get, that you say, well, wait a second. How do I end up with 27,000 deaths from 10,000 cases? Yeah. So I want to understand what yeah. that figure okay. really is. The, when Ted talks about, when Dr. DeWeese talks about 30 to 50 people treated for every one life saved, that's among people who are screen detected, okay? The European Screened study, and found to have cancer. That's right. The European study, remember, screening is going to find disease that we would not have found if there had not been any screening. And indeed, a man in the United States who chooses to be screened doubles his risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer from about 1 in 10 to 1 in 5 from 10 percent to 20 percent. You mean if you don't look, you don't find, but if That's you look, right. you find. That's exactly right. Now, by the way, on the other hand, if we take the European study, which showed a 20 percent relative risk and decrease of death uh, with a soft p-value, so we're not 100 percent sure of that finding, that, that's 3 percent lifetime risk of death going down to 2.4 percent lifetime risk of death. So uh, the answer to your question is the uh, 30 to 50 to 1 is in a screen-detected population. Right, but I wanted to see how it boiled down to when you get to the 192,000 versus the 192,000 yeah. for these two types of cancers, and more people die of breast cancer, a cancer that we can look at with mammography. We, we, we have a better feel for being able to see it, feel it, and eliminate it, but you have a higher number. To me, that begs the question of when we use the number 192,000 in prostate cancer, are we basically saying, here's a cancer we're not very good at actually curing, but we're, we're, we're also not very good at putting a number up there that are really the number that kill you. Does this include a number that people would live 20 more years? Oh, if, yeah. So the 192 versus 192, 192,000 that says invasive breast cancer, these are going to kill women. And the 192 of prostate, not so much. That's right. Many are not going to kill. But if, I, if, you'll, if you'll bear with me, the big I, difference... I, and I don't want to interrupt you excessively, but I just w would like to know, after the fact, if you could, if you could re-estimate that 192,000 to give me your best guess of invasive prostate cancer so that, so that we could look at the cases versus death, because it, it, they make them look like breast cancer is less successful in treatment and more likely to kill women, when in fact it looks yeah. like there's less cases, but we don't do so good with yeah. prostate cancer. That, that's actually the reason why I like to look at mortality rates rather than absolute numbers. And what I was going to say is we have nine randomized trials in breast cancer that consistently show that mammography screening decreases the mortality rate. Uh, nine. Two of those nine happen to focus in when it, women in their 40s, by the way. Uh, we have four randomized trials in prostate cancer that have ever been attempted. One actually was with digital rectal exam and not PSA. Three of those four trials actually show a slight increased risk of mortality in the screened arm versus the unscreened arm. One of them, the European study, shows that 20% decrease in mortality. So the reason why there's uncertainty is we've got three studies that say that this screening stuff could be like prostate, or like uh, lung cancer screening back in the 1960s, and we got one study that says no, it does save lives. Well, let me just concentrate on two last quick questions. One is the Europeans, regardless of whether they lower mortality a lot, less, more, lower mortality because of what they do or not, they spend less. Is that correct? I mean, they, they've basically decided whether it was because of the cost or because they didn't see a benefit, they've decided to prescribe less action, uh, both in testing and in, in treatment. Yes, sir, and that relates directly to the healthcare debate that was going on right now. There's an American tendency that if you have a technology that you think works, go out and do it. I can name 12 things over the last century. You mentioned the Halstead mastectomy earlier. Remember, we did that for 75 years because Dr. Halstead said it was a good thing, and we criticized all the people who wanted to do an evaluation of it for more than 75 years. Finally, we get around to doing an evaluation of it, and we find out that a lumpectomy and radiation is equal to the Halstead mastectomy. We did the wrong thing for 75 years. This thing came out, PSA came out in the late 80s, and we started pushing it. 
started encouraging people to get it rather than doing an adequate evaluation. The Europeans actually decided to do an adequate evaluation. The contamination rate on the European study is so low, that is the number of guys in control who did not get the PSA, because you can't get a PSA over there unless you're in a study to see if it works. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to, I realize I'm begging the indulgence very quickly, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Stern, you, you, because you're someone who's talking about an alternative, anyone who's talking about where we should invest in research for alternatives, including, Dr. Mueller, if you're talking about a next generation PSA that wouldn't be such a shotgun approach to actually diagnosing specific cases of invasive uh, cancer. But Dr. Stern? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, um, I would like to refocus a couple of numbers. Um, I think the numbers you cited need to be put in a slightly different perspective with, an, uh, with a slightly different statistics um, that frame prostate cancer as a patient care crisis in spite of the numbers you just cited, which is absolutely accurate. If we look at the number of men who fail on prostate cancer treatment Every year, it's 70,000 men. What it means in practical terms, about 50% of men undergoing prostate cancer treatment fail, and prostate cancer progresses and becomes life-threatening. This is 70,000 uh, men. If you look at another number, in August 2006, there was a study in over 76,000 men published by University of Michigan. Uh, and it demonstrated at unnecessary treatment. And it demonstrated that up to 54% of men with early localized prostate cancer have unnecessary treatment. That's why it is, and with billions of dollars in healthcare costs, in procedures alone, we never could get access to hospitalization costs and related data. The bottom line is that you have essentially one and a half men undergoing treatment failing on treatment on one side. On the other hand, you have roughly one in two men who have failed treatment. And where we failed, we do not have accurate diagnostic information, either biomarkers for mass screening or imaging to create patient-tailored appropriate treatment. That's why uh, investment, as Dr. Devis pointed out, in diagnostic information is that critical. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I think the day after we uh, eulogize Jack Murtha, it tells all of us that we don't want to have procedures unless they're going to yield the right result because procedures can lead to other uh, loss of life and loss of, of quality of life. So I thank Chairman Yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, now yield to uh, the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Diane Watson. Um, Dr. Braley, thank you, uh, all panelists, for being here and for your testimony. And um, I'd like to address Dr. Braley. Uh, you've argued that prostate screening began to be implemented before adequate studies were conducted and that such studies are still needed. In the meantime, who should be screened? When should they be screened? Should black men first and then at one age and then white men at another? And how should screening be utilized in the treatment? It is, and you might have given us some answers no, before I came in. No, no, no. Good, important questions. I think right now the most important thing is to tell men the truth because a lot of what I'm hearing on advertisements and other places, sometimes from hospitals that make money off of treating prostate cancer, sometimes from prostate cancer survivor groups who want to do the right thing. Prostate cancer survivor groups, they're frequently supported by industry that makes these tests, I'll say, um, frequently but not always. I think people need to know the right they need to know the right information, which is we don't know if this test saves lives. There's some very smart people who think that it does. I actually think it saves lives. I think it saves lives, but I know we have to treat a large number of people in order to save each life. 
Some men may want to take the option of getting screened, and we should support those men. Some men, knowing this, may want to not get screened, and we should support and not criticize those men for that decision. And I really do believe we need to get into informed decision making. The American Cancer Society is at favorite informed decision making since 1997. It's just people would read what we said and then say the ACS says men should get screened. The ACS says men should be informed and make a decision is what we wanted people to say. And so that's why we changed our guideline. Our guideline as of yesterday is within the physician-patient relationship. None of this free screening that's done to generate income by hospitals. Within the physician-patient relationship, the physician and the patient should have a conversation, talk about the uncertainties, the known risks, and the possible benefits and make a decision as to what's right for the patient. That's what we need to be doing. You know, years ago uh, when I was in the Senate in California chairing the Health and Human Services Committee, uh, I also was very involved in a statewide organization looking at black women with breast cancer. A few months ago, the question, uh, not the question, but uh, the directive was out that uh, women ought to wait later uh, until they're 40 before they do the screenings. Now, I'm talking about breast cancer in this uh, instance. The women that were part of our study and was directed at UCLA under Dr. Love, by the time a year or two passed, all of them were dead. So I was struck that there is something in the DNA among African Americans uh, that causes cancer at an early, earlier age. And I'm recognizing that because I carried the bill for the first screenings uh, on prostate cancer among black males. Uh, are we, and I think you might have answered this, you said it has to be an individual thing, but I do see African Americans more prone towards prostate and breast cancer than other groups. What will we have to do and how much time will it take us to come up with some decisions on just when? Yeah, unfortunately we lost a lot of time because we started advocating the screening in the early 90s and indeed one of the reasons, you know, how, how we lose time is saying everybody should get screened dissuaded men from going in the studies to figure out if screening worked. And things like the study that, the American study that just reported was five years late because of slow accrual. Why would you go into this study when all these advertisements are saying everybody should get screened, screening saves lives? Okay, that's, that's, that's how we slowed down. Now, once we have got people to understand that this is a huge problem. It's probably going to be 10 or 15 years before we can get a good answer. And it's through support of things like Dr. Moeller's study. It's through support of many of the wonderful things that have gone on in the Department of Defense studies and, and the NCI. Uh, and it's also, it, it takes doctors who are practicing medicine to realize this was a problem. This overdiagnosis thing was poo-pooed by a number of physicians in practice in the early 1990s when those of us in academia were saying that it's a problem. Now we've got numerous studies. The prostate prevention trial is my favorite. It show, it's the only study that ever biopsied men who had normal PSAs. It showed that PSA screening for men in their 60s over seven years can diagnose 13% with prostate cancer. It also showed that PSA misses just as many prostate cancers as it found. And of that 26% of men in their 60s who were diagnosed with prostate cancer, we know only 3% are going to die, three out of the 26. Okay, so that's an indication of this over-treatment thing. Uh, there was actually a vote in the Integration Committee for the Department of Defense, these are survivors and doctors, in earlier in this decade that said that more money for the Defense Department ought to go toward seeing how to get men screened and take that money away from studies of the biologic behavior of prostate cancer. So we're letting our emotions, I'm, I'm very emotional about this because I want men 
to get the right thing, and I know that I'm hearing that men are not getting the right information. Gentlewoman's time has expired. I now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Bradley, let me ask you this, and, and any of our other panelists. You know, uh, the problem is is that I think it was Lou Gossett said it a little bit earlier when he was talking about he was talking about African American men, but I think he could have applied this to men. Period. Are squeamish about uh, these the prostate and the exams, and uh, and so I'm trying to figure out. And so they already are not likely to go in for the exam. Don't want to talk about it. And so how do you make the jump with all this, this new information that just came out yesterday? It gives men an excuse not to do it. I'm telling you, and, and men look for excuses yeah. not to do this. They already don't want to do it, but they really don't want to do it. They say, see, told you it's not going to do any good anyway. I can hear him now. So, I mean, how do you, how do we deal with that? And, and it seems as if, then the question also for them becomes, well, even if I go in, and they may, it sounds like there's confusion. You, you, you follow me? There is confusion, sir. And so, so, so what's the best argument to a man who's looking at you right now to go and try to address this issue? Well, I can tell you the argument to address the issue. I can't tell you the argument why a man should be screened because I, I actually think that our guideline yesterday and the experts came together and said if a man doesn't want to be screened, we should support that man in that decision. Okay. Okay. But I, I do think that we should be talking about prostate cancer. A uh, big problem in the black community is a number of men who don't have prostate cancer but have benign prostatic hyperplasia and difficulty urinating and are suffering from that and won't go get it treated or get it assessed. I, I'm, I'm, I do think we need to talk about these things openly. And I'll also tell you, uh, growing up and becoming a screening expert, growing up from the inner city of Detroit where all my relatives were afraid that people weren't telling them the truth, I grew up to find out that my relatives were pretty wise because on this issue there is a lot of things out there that is not truthful, that is misleading. You know, we do not know if prostate cancer screening saves lives. Some of us think it does, but I hear routinely that prostate cancer screening saves lives. I hear routinely that any man who doesn't get screened is a fool. Yet, I had nothing to do, by the way, with the ACS guideline. I'm a, I'm a staff person. These were volunteers. These were doctors, epidemiologists, outcomes people, and some patients who met over a period of a year looking at all the literature that we have and they came up with and indeed they came up with the same thing that they came up with in 2001 there's huge uncertainties here people need to know there's huge uncertainties and then make a decision about what is right for them gotcha dr stern and then i'll go to you dr moeller dr stern the imaging is it do does it appear that the imaging Dr. DeWeese a little bit earlier testified that there's the radical type of uh, prostate cancer and then he sound there's a more like a I don't know dormant I don't know whether that's the right word but is it is it the belief that this imaging will be able to detect which one it is nice and loud please oh mic on Thank you. Not only did we always believe that with appropriate research funding it would be possible to develop imaging tools that will be able to differentiate uh, dormant from aggressive prostate cancer, but there is current emergent, emerging scientific information that points at, in that direction specifically. At University of California in San Francisco, uh, data were produced that magnetic resonance spectroscopy may help to differentiate aggressive from non-aggressive pr uh, prostate cancer. Only um, in a few days, on March 10, there would be a study published by my co-leader of admitech funded International Prostate MRI Working Group, Dr. Yella Barnes at, uh, in Holland, and he will, he will be presenting data, pilot studies in 51 men where 
um, novel MRI technology, diffusion-weighted imaging, was able to, to discriminate aggressive from non-aggressive prostate cancer. Now, these are pilot studies. Further extensive research is needed in order to have definitive answers. That's why investment in uh, imaging research is critical. Thank you. I see my time is up. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Moeller, I think Dr. Moeller wants to say something, but I know we're running out of time. Yeah, Dr. Moeller, if you could be brief, because yes. I just uh, wanted to reiterate that I think you've heard a message here that we need, in addition to a way to detect prostate cancer, we need a way to separate autopsy from the lethal prostate cancer. Right. That's a common theme. Um, the problem right now is that men have to decide what to do now. They cannot wait right. for Dr. Browley's 15-year studies uh, from now. Uh, what happens in the 15 years since the American and European screening studies were designed is medicine advances. And then the results uh, 15 to 20 years into the future become obsolete. And so men are being faced with this difficult problem of what to do now. And uh, the, the NCCN guidelines and emphasize aggressively finding prostate cancer in young men. Because the young man who you can detect prostate cancer, he's going to live so long that he's going to die from it. You need to relax as men get older because they will suffer the, the uh, increasing incidence of the autopsy type cancer that you don't want to go aggressively find. So PSA and treatment are being justifiably criticized right now because there's been overzealous use of both PSA for early detection and treatment. We need more science to separate this autopsy cancer from the lethal cancer, and then we wouldn't have to be having uh, so many of these discussions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, let me indicate that uh, we will leave the record open for five additional days for additional comments and information. Let me thank, and let me just thank all of you for um, your testimony today. And, um, I tell you, it points out that we still have a long way to go, and of course, uh, but we appreciate you know your work and what you're doing, and we look forward to working with you as we move forward. I think this is a very important hearing um, when you look at the um, statistics and what's really going on. So let me thank you again, and at this time the the hearing is adjourned. Thank you, sir. <laughs>